All right. So hopefully this isn't the one that gets us canceled. Um, I was thinking about calling this <laughs> dating advice for acupuncturists. Maybe we should just say how to build rapport in the clinic. I think that that's a good one. Dating advice for acupuncturists is a yeah. persnickety area. It's not the first thing you think, right? But the reason I bring this up is uh, I've talked about this in other places before, and I feel like, at least to me, there is some overlap between going on a first date and seeing a patient for the first time. Like when you go when you go on a first date, it's like you're really nervous. You want to make a good impression. You want to establish a connection. You want the person to come back for a second date. And I feel like that kind of overlaps with seeing a patient for the first time. And some of those skills overlap as well. And now just to be clear, I'm not like don't date your patients. That, that's not what we're talking about here. Do not do that. Ethically, but, do not do but that. But I do feel like some of those skills do overlap. And I think in a previous conversation, you let slip that before Chinese medicine, you were a dating coach. So I thought it might be it might be good to get your take on this. What do you think? Absolutely. I think one of the first things we have to look at is, one, we're talking about general social skills. Social skills are translatable to anything you do. And it's going to be particularly a point where your interactions with people like sales, marketing, uh, marketing being more of the strategy, but at least on the sales and interaction pieces, that's all you do as an acupuncturist. If the client doesn't like you, it's already going to make a huge problem in terms of your clinical success rates. So this is where you have to be able to uh, build rapport, uh, build some sort of connection with your client. So they're like, okay, <laughs> you're not a dick, right? Because if they're thinking that this person's a jerk, I don't want to see them again. Doesn't matter what Qigong you do, doesn't matter what techniques you do, they're not coming back to see you. That first impression, like as they would say, you can't make a new first impression. It happens once and that's it. And kind of some background on this. Uh, before I got into Chinese medicine, for my undergrad, I studied mathematics and computer engineering. And so as you can imagine, Computer engineers don't necessarily have the reputation of being really good with people. And so when I got into TCM, I knew that this was going to be a deficit for me that I think when I first started out, I had this idea that as long as my skills were good enough, that as long as I got results in the clinic, that would be enough that people would come running to see me because of the results that I got. Mm -hmm. But as I started treating patients, I realized that that's not actually true, that a lot of what makes people come back is the connection they form with you. And I realized that I did not have those skills. So I think it's kind of like almost like they say in sales that in order for someone to buy from you, they have to know, like, and trust you. And I did not have those skills of having mm -hmm. people know, like, and trust me. And it was something that I consciously had to work on. Right. And I mean... I'm in the same boat here with Nicholas. It's like, you know, I did apprenticeships and things like that. And from a social structure in China, historically, when you're talking about like family lineages or imperial doctors or things like this, uh, the pedigree was you had to get results. We don't care how good your social network was because you're treating the emperor or you're treating aristocrats or you're treating people in general. So if you couldn't produce it, guess what? You're replaced and you'd probably be blacklisted if you didn't have the skill sets. However, there was an unspoken rule with all that, which was everyone understands Chinese uh, social norms, which are different value sets than Western norms in some ways. So if uh, you got a referral from somebody in a Chinese cultural standard, you basically were like the boss, boss person because they tested you ahead of time. They qualified you ahead of time by your reputation, by your family lineage, by whatever it was. So they were bought into the treatment ahead of time. Do we have that here in Western culture? Well, we do and we don't. If it's a reference from a friend, we know it's stronger, but that's not how most people are making their bread and butter in a clinical standard. You're getting it mostly through uh, cold approaches, as I would call it, cold calls, where people would just say, hey, I found you on Google, or maybe we saw you on YouTube. I've had people um, said that even for the Qigong videos. They're like, oh, we saw you on YouTube. We totally like you talked about Qigong. We feel like we have a connection on things. But that's a little bit different. That's a reputation preceding me now because I have a visual content. Much like Nicholas here has, everyone knows him as a YouTube superstar for TV. CL. So this is like the reputation precedes you, but 
if we both didn't have social platforms or we didn't do this podcasting or anything like that, we'd be like, no one would know us. And then now we got to do uh, marketing of the clinic or our social services in a different way. Yeah, I was going to say, it's like we've it's like we've already created a first impression. So that gives us an advantage here. And I suppose maybe you could do the same thing by having mm -hmm. a website that introduces yourself and having some testimonials that can start to give a first impression. Absolutely. And then this is going back to who do you serve? This is talking about demographics and everyone's like, well, you know, what do you mean demographics? We don't get all technical around things. However, it's true. You're not going to be able to serve everybody. So even from the dating point, when I was working with people, I make them analyze themselves and be like, well, who would fit your life? You're, if you're like an engineered person and you want a punk rocker, but you don't like punk rock, yeah. it's going to be a hard fit here, right? So your values as a practitioner definitely are going to be seen through um, – from your clients like it's pretty well known here for our client base they want coaching they want lifestyle coaching to make the best uh life that they can get through chinese medicine techniques and that means we're doing holistic care across the board this is the spiritual side this is the mundane physical side but it's everything that's really what we provide here that's different than everybody else for differentiations so i'm congruent at that point so people when they discuss things with me i'm like yeah this is how you do it because i've gone through the experience i've walked through that door this is your call card essentially but if you don't have the experiences and you can't link into it where you're telling your own narrative and your own story people don't know how to connect with you that and then they can't say hey is this person the right person for me as a practitioner yeah and i guess i could see that when we were talking about imperial china i could see a situation where you're actually not supposed to talk to the patient, like if you, if you were dealing with, with someone of high status. Correct. Um, but in the same way that if you were a medical doctor 50 years ago, you just had so much authority that you didn't have to connect with a patient. You were just mm -hmm. automatically seen as an authority. And I think that's something that we don't have. But anyway, about halfway through school, about the same time I started seeing patients, I started going on a lot of first dates. And so that's kind of how I, I kind of developed this theory that maybe some of the, the skills I was practicing in the dating world could be applied to uh, seeing patients for the first time. And maybe I'll just throw out some examples and you can tell me what you think of them. So one, sure. so this was like, I had a very engineer nerdy approach to it. I was like, I'm going to go online and research all these dating tips. And one of them was this concept of eliciting values. And so when I try to explain this to people, mm -hmm. I think maybe the best example I can give is, have you ever gone on a first date and it feels like you're being interviewed? Like you sit across from each other and you're just kind of like, where are you from? How many siblings do you have? What's your favorite type of music? What is your occupation? And it's like, this is, this is really good if you're like trying to compile a dossier on someone, but it doesn't really it help them. It it's doesn't really help them make connection. a connection. And so this idea of listening values is instead of getting factual information, try to ask questions that get values or opinions. So like one way I'd do this is I would start out by asking, you know, what do you do? What's your job? What's your occupation? And that's like a simple one word answer. But then I would follow up by saying, is that something you enjoy? How did you get into it? Is this something that you're really passionate about? Or is it just something that you're doing to pay the bills? And so that way you're getting more into the, the value system of the other person. And I've seen Absolutely. this happen in the clinic, too. I actually kind of stole this from a J.R. Worsley Five Element practitioner because I think they do a lot of rapport building. And this, he would say things like, where are you from? And they say, oh, I'm from the small town. And they say, um, what do you like about it or what's so good about it? Even if people came up to him and said, good morning, he'd be like, what's so good about it? And it's kind of a little bit sarcastic, but it's also a good way of eliciting values. Well, it's eliciting values and the point of like, what is a value of a mode of quality? I think like, let's break down the value piece because you said eliciting. Eliciting means you're, you essentially are trying to open up the door so they can provide their own experience that you can relate with. So when you're saying what's good about the morning, because it's a default behavior people have, they'll say good morning and automatically you're like, good morning, but is it good? This this is like what what makes it good? Was it the coffee? Was it that you got up today? Yeah. Like that it could be as simple as that. 
right? So this is where when that that rapport built of listening values means I can connect with you on a level that you actually value. We are on the same team. This gets into a us versus them mentality, which, you know, business psychology talks about this all the time, but this is just social communications also. We as people, like, you know, let's even take us, for example. It's like, all right, we're TCM people. That means we by default aren't what? X, 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 X. Name whatever role you want to be in. So we're on the same team. That means we have something in common. If we have one thing in common, it most likely means we have multiple things in common, whether it be philosophy, outlooks of uh, life, whatever it is. And then from there, your goal as a practitioner is essentially you're supposed to be connecting to everyone, in my opinion. So I'll switch my language all the time. And people have seen this when I run certain clinics. They're like, did you just like switch into like, the, I'm like, absolutely. If someone's coming in from um, a working class perspective, like um, let's just say they're a driver. This is what I'm going to be like, okay, long day on the road, all this stuff. And I'm going to start, I, I would call them scripts, but they're not scripts. They're my experiences that I've actually analyzed to communicate. So it's on repeat. They're my own personal stories. So this is not a lie per se, but they are in a way that I am able to pull them up at any point. If you say anything to me, I have something in to engage with. So if someone's coming in from a high CEO perspective, I'm like, all right, you want numbers. You want X around statistics. We're going to have those conversations more. If I'm talking to an artistic person um, that loves the arts and that's what they do at living, I'd be like, it's hard to make an art living. It's hard. Like, are you a visual artist or are you a musician? That's already a big piece. When people say arts, it's a general piece. Is it visuals or is it music? They're both arts. But I'll tell you right now, between those two um, viewpoints of arts, radically different approaches to life right if it's an uh, artist type person i'll start i'll start descriptively painting the words i'll be like is it oil or is it water painting again i'm a, i used to really do a lot of art stuff for visuals so i understand the nuances of like the different art pieces i'll be like are you abstract or are you more realism it makes a big difference the way you describe things so as soon as i start pinpointing the value pieces i'll be like it's like this and i've worked with a visual artist recently i might say well all right so imagine your body is a canvas and the canvas is you have some murky colors how do you transform those colors well you have to paint them and add other secondary colors and then you work with it from there then they're like oh so how's this work with my back pain i'd say well the back pain here is a splotch just assume that i just randomly some threw some paint at it how do you make this better well it has certain correlations blah 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 right so this is where changing your language, changing your body language even. Like we're talking about listing values, but this is also with rapport particularly, uh, we would be actually doing similar body language. We call this mirroring essentially. So this is where, you know, you and me are doing it right now because we're, you know, we, we, we're good friends. We know each other on things. So this is where like, you know, he nods his head, I nod my head. We're kind of doing the same body pieces, but that builds a connection there right. also. So this is where you can do that with your clients, where if they come in and if I were to context it, say, I'm a six foot two dude, I'm big. And if I have a very tiny uh, female, let's say five, four, my body language is working against me mm -hmm. completely. Like no female is going to be comfortable with that as a practitioner. So what I generally do is I take a knee and I look at them eye to eye or I'll sit down and I'll let them yeah. stand because it's about the same height. And my body language ends up being open. And then when they actually do say something like a move forward, I'll move forward. And when they move back, I move back. This comes almost like a dance, but everyone does this subconsciously already. If you think about your friends, you think about your family, you all match each other to some level. The difference is I can do it consciously because this was essentially a professional job for me. And I was uh, literally coaching people on it. Hey, real quick, I just wanted to let you know about two products that you should definitely be aware of. Evil Bone Water and Dragon Blood Balm. Both of these are topicals and they actually work really well together. We've talked about Evil Bone Water before. It's a high quality made in America version of Junggu Shui. It's an alcohol based liniment and it has ingredients like San Chi. So it's really good at invigorating blood and stopping pain. Dragon Blood Balm is a balm with jojoba oil and beeswax as its base. And this one has ingredients like Shui Jie, Ru Xiang, and Mo Yao. So this one invigorates blood and also promotes regeneration of flesh. So this was originally created for rock climbers who 
tore up their hands and had sore tendons from all the rock climbing, but it's also good for any kind of cracks or sores on the skin. So if you get dry cracked hands from the cold weather or from washing your hands too much, this could be a good solution. And like I said, these two work really well together. You can put the evil bone water on first, and that has a lot of aromatics that open things up and help things penetrate. And then after it dries, you can put on the dragon blood balm and the oil and beeswax will moisturize and kind of put a protective barrier on top. And both of them are good for invigorating blood and healing sinews, muscles, and skin. So if you wanna try both together, you can get a bundle pack from the Dragon Blood Balm website. I'll put a link in the description below with a coupon for 15% off. And if you're a practitioner, these are also great to sell as products in your clinic. So I'll put links to where you can sign up for wholesale accounts in the description below as well. We've also had Mark Brinson, the creator of Evil Bone Water on the podcast. So if you wanna hear the full story, you can check out session 14. And I've actually just recorded an episode with one of the creators of Dragon Blood Balm. So that will be coming out next week. So you can keep an eye out for that. But let's go ahead and get back to the conversation with Zach. So it sounds like what I'm hearing so far is we want to establish this frame that we're on the same team. That's not like I'm the practitioner and you're the patient. We want to be on the same side of the table, on the same team. And some of the specific strategies you talked about doing that are um, ask, asking questions about them uh, mm -hmm. that, go, that, that gets to their core, but then also disclosing some of your own experiences that relate to where they are and then also modifying your language or modifying your vocabulary using terms that they're familiar with. So I feel like that's tactically um, where we're at right now. And then I think yeah. um, what you were getting into is, I feel like this might be a technique in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, where they talk about mirroring and leading, where you can start by mirroring a person's uh, body language. And once you create that connection through your mirrored language, you can actually alter your body language and they might start mirroring you. So it's kind of like you can lead them in a certain direction. So this is, I'm not sure I've actually paid attention to this too much, but I think it might be something like if a patient comes in and they're kind of downcast and they're talking kind of quietly, then maybe I'll match my voice that if they're talking slow and quiet, I'll start talking slow and quiet and be like, oh yeah, it's kind of a gloomy day out there trying to meet them where they're at. And then maybe over time kind of open up and talk more excited or something like that. Is, is that what we're talking about here? We could go there. That's one strategy you could go. Meet them where they're at, and then it's basically the rule of two steps forward, one step back. Right? So you lead them, and you let them lead, and then you keep pulling them forward to where you want them. So it's basically like, uh, okay, you're here. You're kind of gloomy. I'll, I'll match your energy, and then we go forward. Right? So that that is usually a good strategy for most people. The other strategy is you just completely just go hardcore like it's – I don't want to say college frosh week, but you're really super excitable, golden retriever, and the person's like all gloomy. What happens? Emotions are contagious. So at that point, that's they have to come up to you, and yeah. you don't match them. So this is where now you got to have an honest conversation with yourself on reflections. Like, what type of person are yeah. you? How's your day? If you don't have the energy today to do things, then what's going to happen? Well, yeah. you're going to be like, eh. Well, you, you might actually have to match them and then you pull them up. But if it's having a good day, there's no reason why you should drop down to them. Um, they'll come up to you a lot faster. But that means you have to hold state. And that's an internal locus control or that's your frame as we discussed. A frame generally is what is the context socially that you're trying to set up for both people. So if I want, if I'm having a good day and I can lower myself, I could drop my energy level slightly and be like, oh, it's a good day, but they're still going to have to pick up a lot more slack. And then when they manage, it'd be like high five. And then you start doing all these body things, right? So for dating, it'd be like, here's a high five, here's a body pivot, whatever it is, right? So this is where in a clinical situation, you still can do that. It's called the table and the entrance. So they come on in, it's a gloomy day, you'll be like, hey, how you doing, so-and-so? And they're like, oh, you know, I got back pain, or oh, I got this illness. And you're like, oh, man, that sucks. It must be hard. And you know the problem. You know these people. If it's brand new, you don't know them. But assuming it's a brand new person, you're like, oh, that's, that sounds like a rough day. How you been keeping with that? And notice how I have a certain pace with my voice. It's like, 
But that means it started slow, and then now I'm picking up the beat, and then as soon as I pick up the beat, they have to match me. If they're not matching me, then I have to go back and say, hey, it's all right, have you had Chinese medicine before? And then they might say, no, yes, maybe so. The, the, the wording here does not matter so much. Right. I could say anything. I'd be like, have you had a Pikachu today? It doesn't matter. Right. So this is where this is kind of you got to listen to the tonality of things. This is now if you have a musical training, this becomes really fun because then you could oscillate. And it is like a it is like a rhythm that you start hitting with your voice. So they come in slow. I'm going to pick it up. If they match me, great. If not, I have to cue down because it might be too intense for them. They may be like, screw it. I'm too tired, man. And we're like, all right. And then I will empathetically from my body language to say, we have a connection. I'd be like, yeah, it's a long day. And then I'm going to start mashing them. And But then I'm, my goal is really not to get to their state. This is what it means to have a frame control or state control. It's basically you're trying to get them to a positive place in the healing. This usually would actually be talked about in Qigong or Feng Shui therapies. Um, if we were talking about like space allocation. So as soon as someone comes into a space, this gets into things like, well, where are they moving? Is it a closed off space? Is it an open space? Is it bright light? Like these things actually matter in your environment because now you're setting up a different uh, whole situation, which is a whole new experience. So. If we take a clinical situation for anybody, person walks through the door, they don't know where you've been, they don't know the building, they might be a new location, that's the first thing. So if I'm in their position, I might say, I don't know this practitioner, I, I, I'm invested enough to book a session with them online, or I heard somebody say, so there's a little bit of trust, or there's a leap of faith, but... You know, the difference between you're in a back alley going to a clinic versus you going to, like, you know, the Marriott for a treatment. There's two different expectations as soon as you see this. So you have your front door piece. They enter in, and then are they welcome or are they greeted? Because as soon as they enter, like, think about when you enter a new space. Like, you go to a store or something. What's the first thing you yeah. say? You look around. You see if there's actual people there. Um, that gets into social proofing, as we call it, and group mentalities. So it's like if it's a clinical piece and you see nobody there, you're like, is this person good? Um, is this person not good? These are questions that will pop in your head. Um, and then you start looking at the aesthetic. Like as soon as people walk through our, our studio, you know we're doing spiritual things because you see essentially you'll have to walk through um, – essentially our spiritual store that's not the clinical store that's not the clinical front but this is like you do walk through a spiritual store you know our values right off the bat right and it's not saying that you have to be a spiritual person to get treatments here absolutely not but it is something to say this is something we do talk about and we can go there if you want to right so with our clients in particular um we they know like they know my background right off the bat. They're like, we came to you because you're a Qigong master. We came to you because um, you're a shaman and a folk priest. And we're all about this holistic learn uh, healing from a soul level or a chi level or whatever level. They want the full shebang. So when um, I start talking about things and the metaphors of life, they're like, yeah, this absolutely connects to me. But they were pre-screened ahead of time or they were pre-qualified for whatever reason. And it could just be as simple as like Google review, or it could be a YouTube video, or it could be your friend or a family member. But all these things do matter in the context of setting up the space and setting up a narrative because this is just a story you're doing. And the story that you lead people in uh, makes a huge difference. You, for all intents and purposes, though we're talking about rapport, the rapport is already happening. As the space is the rapport first. So if you have a dirty place that is like unrepresentative of you and your practice, you are incongruent. So if you started saying, hi, we are doing a lot of things here and here's all the science stuff, but you're not that, then people are going to be confused. And if people are confused, they can't trust you. So the, the, there's a lot of intricacies on this. And then even just to set up initially for 10 questions, if you do that or um, whatever it is, you get them to sit down. What's the seating arrangement? What's the space? What's the lighting? How are you sitting? Because what most people are taught initially is, and I've seen this, <laughs> and I'm like, don't do this. It's doing clinic, right? They'll literally be like, hi, how are you doing? Yeah. Right in front of you. And, um, you know, it's one thing if it's a female doing this. Um, it's yeah, another thing especially if it's a male with a female patient. Yeah. But either way, it's bad. 
Right. Mm -hmm. It's bad across the board. Because what happens when I sit in front of somebody, even if I'm a female, it comes down to this is oppositional. We're not friends. I don't know you right now. Uh, I trust you enough, but people are like, oh, now you're getting to like this fight or flight. That's what you've established. So your space dynamics matter. You have to go in at a 45 degree angle or 35 degree angle. So I'm always, if someone's here, I might be like, hey, how you doing? And I'm leaning in slightly and I'm talking to them like it's a, we're, we're having a secret here. Right. And then I might say, hey, you know, tell me about those bowel movements. And they're like, what? And I'm like, you know, I have to know this. It's your medical health. I need to know this. And then they're like, oh, OK. And then I back off because that was a little bit intense. That's a little bit of a personal thing to be like, how's your bowel movements? I mean, hell, their yeah. partners don't even know about this. Your family probably doesn't even know about this. That's a very intimate question. So to say, tell me your secret and I'm out, that gives you a space psychologically, emotionally to yeah. take that. So this is a side profile where I'm usually going to take a side profile for most people. There are times I will do a front if they mm -hmm. do it themselves. So if they end up turning to me, then I yeah. will match them. And that's the report. They're saying, we're on the same team again. It is a us versus them mentality consistently. Um, and it starts becoming an adventure. And the more times you could have an adventure in your treatments, the better this is going to be because it went from what your store door or whatever the initial building was. They went through that journey then they get to the little waiting room area and then they have to get to the treatment. The treatment's another, yeah. that's a third date. Essentially you've gone through three different things. So at that point they have to trust you. And now it's what's your etiquette on the bedside manner. That's a whole different conversation of rapport building, but there's a lot of layers here that people are like, this gets into like retail therapy and all that stuff that people are like, I don't need to do that. It's like you do because they are looking at the psychology. They are looking at people's reactions are. So all those things do matter. Every single, uh, every single step is either building you up or tearing you down. And the better you can get that control, the better, well, your rapport building is. Yeah, I feel like that was something I read on the internet back in the day that like when you go on a date with someone, avoid sitting across from them because again, it's kind of like an interview type thing and like try to try to sit at like right. a 90 degree on the table or a 45 and then it's more like you're two people hanging out on a couch together. It's it's more friendly. And so I feel like in this context, it's it's kind of setting up this frame that again, we're on the same team that um, uh, there's a collaboration rather than just a face to face interview. So it sounds like we talked about um, some mirroring and leading where it's you can either match the person and then try to guide them in a direction. So if they come in all gloomy, you can start off all gloomy and do a two steps forward, one step back. Or you can just come in with the exact opposite. You could – if they're kind of gloomy, you could you could do a mm -hmm. cartwheel and say, hey, how's it going? I, everything's great. I'm too blessed to be stressed and hopefully pull them back up. I can see that backfiring yeah. as well, but yeah. – um, that that's another thing. Um, and I guess I should say that there's probably a lot of people that like this stuff is obvious. This is just like how you how you be a normal human being. But again, when, <laughs> but again, when you're yeah. like when you come from a computer programming background and you don't have these people skills, this is the kind of stuff I actually had to analyze and and really look at to see like what's the what's the proper strategy. Um. Another thing we mentioned in there is this idea of frame. And I think this is an important one, um, not just in establishing rapport, but one of the things I hear in the clinic that I really hate is I have a lot of new students who would say, fake it till you make it. And I, and I never really liked that phrase. It sounds kind of like you don't have confidence, yeah. you're kind of deceitful, you're faking it. So what I like better is, is that phrase of control the frame. And this is maybe difficult to explain to people, but sometimes the way I think of it is when we say frame, that's your subject, that's each individual's subjective interpretation of an objective reality. So let's just assume temporarily that there is such a thing as an objective reality that is the same for everybody. I think quantum physics might disagree with it, but let's just say there's such a thing as an ex objective reality. Even if that's true, each person will experience that reality differently. I mean, it could be that just people take yes. in different information through different senses, oh, so, so they'll be getting different information. But more importantly, all that information is filtered through their background experiences, um, 
their conditioning of what they've been uh, punished or rewarded for, that there's all these background experiences that color that objective reality so they have a subjective interpretation. And where this gets really interesting is if there's more than one person in the room, it's like whoever has the strongest frame wins or whoever has the strongest sense of reality that you can pull other people into that reality. And so I think the like the easy right. example of this would be if you go to a party and you're wearing like a stupid hat or something like that. If you believe in the core of your being that this silly looking hat is the coolest thing in the world, you can pull other people into that reality and they will also believe it's the coolest thing in the world. Whereas if you're, if you're really self-conscious and you think, right. oh, this hat makes me look dumb, people are going to laugh at me, then other people will pick up on your body language and your cues and they'll fall into that reality of this hat is stupid, we're going to laugh at him. Or this is like when people get – get backstage at a concert, even though they don't have backstage tickets. They're just like, just act like you belong and everyone will assume that you actually belong. It's like you're creating a strong reality and pulling people into it. Circling this back to a clinical perspective, I think that this is actually a better way to think about it rather than fake it till you make it is you can control the frame that because you're the person in charge, you're wearing the lab coat, people will automatically default to your version of reality and so you, you have to be careful about maintaining the reality that you want. Correct. And this is important because what you mentioned here is the white lab jacket, right? That's already a presupposition where there's an assumption there that a white jacket is professional because it is working on the lines of you're a medical person. Now in China, we know historically at the current point in time that medical doctors have to be your foundation before you become a TCM person. Like it's actually a prerequisite. You're an MD before you're a TCM in China. There are some exceptions to that rule, but the majority is you are an MD. So for them to wear a white lab jacket yeah. shows authority. Now, what are we in the West? Are we authority figures? I'll be the first one to say, hell no, you're not. <laughs> Right? So you trying to get a 30 wearing a nice white lab jacket, well, no, it's not going to happen. It looks like you're a punk and not a good one. Right? So this is where people are like, oh, I'm more professional, I'm more clean. And I'd say, yes, you are, but is that the impression you want? Because people come to us because they don't want to deal with MDs, because they've been more or less screwed by the medical system for whatever reason. So you're actually echoing now their fears. When you're in a white jacket, you might act a little bit differently. You might use more language. But then when you start using terms that they don't understand, like here's the chi, here's the blood, here's the yin, you have just extracted yourself to be an MD in their eyes. So this is knowing where your clients are coming from. So even on the frame control piece here is, do I want to associate with that fear? No. <laughs> I will do something completely different. Right? So this is where, I mean... Everyone knows me, I wear a three piece, right? But that's actually what I do in clinic. If it wasn't like for certain things, like right now I'm doing scrubs, but basically it's like uh, people know me for the three piece and you know, that's yeah. what people came for essentially. And that's very different compared to what people come in for. Yeah. And I think that's usually. the thing where it's like, whatever you do, you can create a reality and draw people into it. So like some people wear scrubs. We, in school, we had to wear white lab coats, but like mm -hmm. Patrick, on the other hand, he shows up in shorts and flip flops. Actually, flip flops are not a, uh, not yeah. ideal when you're dealing with needles. So don't do that. But he, he would show up in shorts and flip flops. But the, the frame that he creates is the reality he creates is that I'm so good at what I do, I don't need to impress you with my clothing. It's kind of like when like the, the truly rich people don't Correct. actually show off their bling. And so it's still this idea of creating yeah. a reality that he's just so confident in what he does. He can create this reality of I don't need to wear professional clothing in order to get you to respect me. You respect me because of my skills. So that's a reality mm -hmm. he creates. But I think another way that this comes up is sometimes I just get questions like, how do you deal with needling Ren 1? Or what do you, how do you get patients when you, ha when you have to have them disrobe? How do you handle that? And I think that's a, a thing where it's like you have to maintain a frame or a state of mind that if you're, if you're needling Ren 1 and you think this is a good point for them, if you adopt this reality of I'm a medical professional – 
Ren one is a completely normal thing for me to do. This is a point that's very helpful and is going to uh, improve their health and improve their patient outcomes. This is a normal thing. Then you project that reality and the patients will just be like, oh, this is a normal thing. He does it all the time. This isn't weird at all. Whereas instead, if you adopt a reality of, oh, Ren Absolutely. one, that's kind of weird. That's kind of icky. I don't know how I feel about this. Oh, the patient's going to think I'm a weirdo because I suggested doing Ren one. Well, then the patient is going to be drawn into that reality that you created. And then they're going to be like, oh, this is really uncomfortable. I'm not sure I want to do this. Same thing with I'm like cupping someone's back and I say, oh, you have to disrobe. If I'm like, yep. you know, I did massage for several years. I'm a medical professional. This is something that's really helpful for the patient. This is something I do all the time. I can just say, hey, I want to get to these points on your back. In order to do that, I'm going to need you to uh, pop off your shirt. So I'm going to step out real quick, let you pop off your shirt, yep. get on the table, and then we'll we'll go from there. Then it's like, oh, this is a normal thing that I do all the time. The patient is completely comfortable. If I say, oh, are you, are you okay if we, if we do some stuff on your back? Are you okay taking, is that something you're comfortable with? Then, then the patient gets drawn into that reality of this is a weird, uncomfortable thing. Well, we can talk about the reality points, but we'll even talk about the emotions, mm. right? I think that that's a much easier way to relate to people. Do you want to hang around with people with anxiety? The answer is usually no. Right. Uh, if you want, and if we look at confidence being a motive state, or at least let's say positivity, do you want to hang around positive people? Usually, yes. So even at the true core crux of congruence, it's are you okay with what you're doing? I think that really is the harder question. So the fake it till you make it is like you may be uncomfortable based on certain belief systems you have like if a person's dating and they're like oh i don't deserve to talk to somebody because i have some fear that's when the fake it till you make it happen saying let's assume you're in a different role let's put you in a let's put you in a different role that does not have this belief system and let's get you to believe in that um, that's what they mean by fake usually it's you're adopting a new belief system where you don't have anything that's actually in conflict to your goal that's still going to take a little bit of working though Right. So this is where you have to progressively work with it. So if someone's not good with CV1 or the red one piece and you're like, well, here's a needle for your junk. It's like, yeah. no, like <laughs> uh, it's going to be kind of weird for most people unless you own it and saying this is appropriate. And that's now you're using authority as a point in the social interaction to say, I know what I'm doing. Right. That's an authority play. You could do a different play and say, okay, maybe you're not so comfortable with CV1 and you say, look, I'd like to try something out. Is that okay with you? But you still have to be confident enough to ask the question, right? But if you're like, oh, well, CV1, it could be okay for you. It's like, sir, can I have some more food? Like it's that type of mentality. Um, you're not going to get the response from people unless now it gets to a point of like, they're going to be like, you're trained. Why are you so different to me right so this is where it's actually okay if you're unconfident call it out it'd be like look it's a new point it's a new treatment are you okay with this i don't know what's going to happen and frankly i think it's best for you based on my understanding but i really don't know at the point that you own it and you own the fear and you own the ah, i don't know what's going to happen most people are going to be like look i trust you enough that i'm here paying you money if that's what you think then we'll go with it um, but this is now getting to like more self-esteem things and being like are you comfortable with yourself you could for all bluntly uh for blunt pieces i mean you you could fuck up on multiple things and if you're not comfortable with your fuck up, people are going to be like, you're not comfortable with your fuck up, right? So, I mean, we're not yeah. talking about medical screw ups, mind you. I have to be yeah. very clear, right? So this is very much like on the social interaction piece of, well, what's happening? And this also gets to another premise. Your interaction is how they skew you. So that's a map of reality now that they're always going to see you through, that filter, so, you know, it could actually be really nice if you were like, yeah, I am i don't really know what the hell I'm doing. That's quite refreshing for most people, actually, saying like you could be that vulnerable and be like, I don't know what's going to happen, but I do think this is best based on my understanding. But that means, again, you're OK with you saying that. Yeah, I feel like this is a thing where it's like the way to get rid of shame is to shine a light on it. And so it's like, if it's, if it's, a, if it's a situation where yeah. it's like, I don't know what I'm doing. If you admit that that's better than 
trying to half acidly fake it and trying to can like like it's just better to be upfront with it. It's better to be upfront with it, but this comes down to who are you? And this is kind of like the piece. It's like you could get away with a bluff. If you are confident enough and you're like, it's done, you could bluff it. Even though you're like, man, what the hell did I just do? I completely yeah. bullshitted this. And people who are still taking it will be like, yeah, you, you got it. But that's you having core confidence or you having a core belief in yourself that you'll make it no matter what. So there's a prerequisite to do the bluff. Right. If you don't have that core confidence and that prerequisite, then you would have to actually, from a social context, admit you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. And that will play off and people will be like, OK, then why don't we help you? But in both frames, you can see that it's a either essentially a domination slash we're on the same team and I'm your true leader or, and you know, we're all awesome together or I don't know. Can you help me out? Both are psychology tactics we can use in sales. Right. So there's a lot more we can go with, but again, it really keeps going back to this. Do you know yourself? And you don't have to be perfect. Yeah, and I feel like sometimes I've gone too far the other way. Like there, like there have been times where like I've been really nervous about needling kidney one. And so it's like, oh, I really want to prepare the patient that like, oh, you got a lot of nerving endings on your feet. This is this might be a very uncomfortable point, but I think it's going to be really good for you. But I just want to make sure that you're OK because this might be a painful thing. And like I build up like I build up this reality of this is going to be a terrible experience. And then and then I do it and they're like, oh, yeah, that was that was totally fine. That was nothing. And it's. And it's kind of like I yeah. caused undue stress because of my my lack of confidence actually actually made the situation worse by causing that stress. And that's a maybe, maybe not, right? Like from the psychology point of the buildup, you essentially got them up and then you essentially said, here's the crescendo point, we're done. But you made them go through all the stress initially and you built it up to a point that they're like, oh, this is nothing. Oh, yeah. It's, 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 it's like setting expectations low and then exceeding them. I did the opposite of setting the bad expectations high and then like coming in below it. Right. Um, another thing we mentioned in there is this idea of social proof. And I think in the dating world, this might have some specific meanings in terms of – Absolutely. Uh, using external factors to convince people you're not a weirdo, I guess. I don't know a good way to describe it. Uh, the best way I would describe it is social proof is uh, not groupthink, but it is an idea of working with your external environment so people can qualify you, right? So we're going back mm -hmm. to those elicited values. You're showing your elicited values through the people you hang out with, the environment you're in, and they actually say something about Yeah, you. so I'm, I'm trying to think of ways we could incorporate in this into the clinic. Like the, the obvious things that come to mind is like if you had a bunch of testimonials and reviews, like if a person walked in and they saw a wall of 55-star yeah. reviews that you've printed out from Yelp, that would be like that's social proof that you get results. And so that, so that would be right. like one obvious example. Or, I'm trying to think like, what are some other right. ways we can. That's an easy one. So let's take community acupuncture. For example, you see 10 people in the room, right? That's an easy one. Um, it's a low price point. The value is it's community acupuncture. It's a sliding scale. Usually at that point, if you see 10, 20 people in a room and they're flipping over consistently, you're like, this person's probably good and knows what they're doing. Now, if you're brand new though, where do you get that? I was going to say, I feel like I've heard this as a tactic where people like, even if they only have five patients a week, they book them all on the, on the same day at the same time. That way, as one patient is walking in, another one's walking out. So even though you're not actually busy, it looks like you're busy. It looks and like that's, you're and busy. And that's, that creates some of that, some of that social, yeah, it creates some of that social proof. Right. This gets into, again, frame control where it's kind of like, this is a pretty standard tactic with the bigger clinics. Right. Like this is like, here's the red carpet. I'm saying the secrets. It's kind of like I know when talking to major clinics they are basically like, yeah, we book everyone at the same time, um, even if it's a slow day. Why? Because the idea is you're busy. And if you're busy, you'll think you're busy. And if you think you're busy, you're busy because you're the main common denominator for the clinic. It's kind of like self-hypnosis, too. <laughs> it is. It is. So this is where if you're just starting off, book everyone, like have your availabilities, but push everyone into the uh, same day. Like even like applications like Jane app and things like that, they'll be like, do you want to look busy? <laughs> right. 
And they will literally have a thing where they're like, these days are slotted off because you can only come in on this day. Now you're getting to the scarcity mentality of saying you are a hot commodity, which, you know, this gets into FOMO. It's like, oh, I got to get the session with so-and-so at this particular time because that's my yeah. time slot. And people will start claiming it too. They're like, I want this time. Right, and you'll see that pretty consistently across the board that people start de- getting defenses on time slots, like they're like freaking like Pokemon cards. Like this is my Pokemon, this is my time slot. And I'm like, well, if you don't, it's like if you don't have it, you don't do it. it it's gone. I can't help you. So you have to get it in. So this is important to understand from a social proof standard. If you're just starting off, get people coming at the same time. Now, say that is not an option even on the table. Testimonials is one way. Another way is space. What's the difference between a uh, 500 square space room versus a 200 room? Well, if you have a lot of empty space, the social proof in this context, there's no people, but the space says you're empty, and that's not a good thing. You want a smaller space when you're first starting off. You want a 300 square feet room or maybe 200 because the space is tiny. So that means it's intimate. You build those connections more. And on top of that, there's no empty space. So people don't feel weird where it's like, why do you have this empty space? Because actually, what's the thing that people psychologically do? Empty space, something's wrong, right? Unless it's like it's built in a certain way, but that's not most clinical rooms. So you have that aspect. And then in terms of people, this is where... Again, if you're starting to get people to come on through, maybe it's like you have a workshop day. You have a monthly hangout. Whatever it is, you get people coming through the door. People are still people. People will see other people and they'll go, oh, all right. But even on social proof, um, and you know, I could call us out on this directly, right? The people know who we are ahead of time. You have a YouTube channel. You have an Instagram. You have thousands of followers. Yeah. There's your social proof. People are like, Nicholas, if he, if you went to a clinic with Nicholas, this dude knows his shit because he has, I don't know what your number is. It keeps increasing, right? Every time I look oh. at it, which is awesome. So it's one of these things like he has thousands of followers. Yeah. Boom. I want to learn from him or I want to get a treatment from him. So there's already a bias of he's popular. Yeah. <laughs> and by association, if you hang out with them, you could be popular for your health. I know that sounds weird, but this is the thing people think in a clinical situation, right? And um, from there, he'll give me the treatment I exactly need because he has so much social proof with the numbers. And on top of that, I can connect with him anytime if I want to watch videos, right? Because, you know, we have a time portal here right now. It's like when you put up the podcast or when you do a video, everyone's like, I could always watch those and you could keep streaming with them. So it's like, you're with them but you're not with them. And that's absolutely brilliant. If that's content creation processes, like I've had people come in and be like, yeah, we've listened to your podcast. We've listened uh, to deeper down the rabbit hole. We've, um, we watch your YouTube videos on Qigong. It's like, you've been there the whole time. I'm like, yeah, because I am there the whole time because I spent the time there and it's a one-on-one interaction now. Um, I'm trying to think if there's other ways to like establish social proof or I guess like reputation, like one-on-one, but I guess it's kind of like the social aspect like requires other people to be there. Well, it also, yeah, it absolutely requires. So this is where if you're working in a multidisciplinary clinic, right? Like that might be a reality for most people. You should know the practitioners. The practitioners should know you. That's referral networks now. Right. So that is a social proof. Also, someone refers to you, they go to you. But I remember even when I was first starting back in the day, it's like, okay, I might work with the chiropractors, but people would see me kind of joking around with all the practitioners and they're like, oh, Zach's talking to the chiropractors. Zach's talking to the naturopaths and everyone seems to like him. That's already social proof. Right. If a client sees that. So that's working with people. But social proof by default says you need other people around you and you need to be seen with other people. Um, so if you're more of a solitary person, your social proof has to come through online content. It has to come through reviews. It has to come through referrals. Um, unless you have like, you know, these workshops and things you're like, Hey, this is Chinese medicine. Here's the five elements. And they see five people in the room there. Right. But you can work with the staff to build this. So another one, and this might be a little bit controversial, but one of the things I remember reading about was, this idea of if you're going to ask somebody out, it's important about like how you frame that question. And to some extent, it's almost a don't ask, just 
make statements instead of questions. So like instead of saying like, oh, you know, maybe if you're not busy, do you think that maybe sometime you'd, you'd like to get together if it's not a big deal? Like that doesn't work very well. Um, no, it doesn't. Maybe, maybe a better approach would just be like don't even ask, make, make statements and saying like – I think you're a really cool person. I'd like to get together sometime to get to know you better. And that's maybe a better approach. Um, and I feel like this, this is another thing that comes up in a clinical um, aspect is I've had, I've seen students do the same thing where they're like, Oh, do you think that you want to come back next week? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's, it's actually, that's not a good way to do it. A better way to do it is say, Hey, I think we made some really good progress today, but as you know, we can't get everything done in the first treatment. I'd like to see you once a week for the next four weeks and then shut up and wait for them to say something. Yes. And this is where it gets into, um, well, it goes back to our frame control conversation. Are you confident? And again, we keep using the word confident, but it's really, are you comfortable with what you're doing? So this is where even if a, would you like to come back or would you like to come back? It's like the tone, it's like one's a statement, even though it's worded as a question, one is actually a question and you're like, I'm unsure about myself. So this is where the general rule of this when I was working with people was downtone, downtone every single time. You can ask a question and it'd be like, do you like Pokemon? And it's like, is that a question or is that a statement? At that point, yeah. it's like, oh, I like Pokemon. Thank you very much. It's yeah. right. It's <laughs> boom. So the tone actually tonalities make a difference. So this is where, honestly, I would say get in front of a mirror, do some acting classes, do some improv. It makes a difference for you to think on your feet, especially if you're more of an introverted person. Because that's unnatural. Like, if you're an extrovert, you'll be like, YOLO, it's a fun time. It does not matter. Um, but as an introvert, it's weird. You're like, because you're kind of like, you want to save time for yourself. You're like, why am I doing this for other people? Because I could play video games. I, I could be reading a book. I could be doing something. It's just how you recharge your batteries. But because of that lack of exposure as an introvert, your skills in certain departments aren't there. So you have to train it up some other way. So this is where downtones are usually an easy crutch as a first point. Second point I would say here, generally speaking, is going to be uh, cut out your uh, ums, uh, what, like these fluff words, yeah. these definitive fluff words that everyone does. The more succinct you can make your language, the better it's going to be. And from there, shorter phrases are better phrases, right? So it's not saying to pull like a John Weston type of like, you know, the spartan type conversations where you're just like boom 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 statement 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 short 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 uh there is a point where the shorter the phrase the bigger the gap silence is awkward but if you are comfortable with silence people are not actually want to fill it in and the more they yeah. invest into the um, conversation the more attached they are to well essentially having a conversation with you and the more enrolled they are in whatever you're um, proposing so with students in a clinic where they say well you know do you want to come back next week i'd say you know it's as you're saying you can change the phrasing so let's have you come back next week All right and so it's just it's an assumption it's done you're coming back next week and this is why i'm telling you why exactly you're coming back uh because if you just say come back next week people are like um why am i coming back like you don't want them to think right in this context so you say hey come on back next week i have a treatment plan involved this is what it is but even during the treatment i mean this is where what are you doing on the table are you having a conversation with them is it pure silence i'll tell you i'm very conversational on the table but i let the person lead if they ask me questions i'm talking to them and they're like what's your story i'm like what story do you want from what chapter <laughs> Because it, 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 it's a novel. And they're like, what? And then we get into it. Uh, however, I am peppering the conversation throughout the time where it's like, well, you know, I think this is going to be probably this much. So I'm already pre-warming them in some ways in the conversation, which, you know, from a dating perspective, when we go back to dating coaching, you would get them to imagine the future with you. This is like the, um, I forget the particular term psychology but you're basically getting them to imagine what it's going to be like because once they imagine it it's already happened remember medicine and magic were not separate for the most of historical time up until basically like the more modern era 
which means like if we looked into western conversation of things hermes god of trickery god of commerce god of sales was still the medical god Mm -hmm. so you still have to get them to imagine things and what would be happening in the future Um, and that's just a nice trick to do because you could say well what would it be like in three sessions i'm giving like you know you might say i i I think this is going to take 10 sessions or so i'm going to do my best to help you on this particular point and this particular point is let's just say shoulder pain this shoulder pain i think it's going to be 10 sessions because you've had a long time with this you've had over a month 10 sessions is over a month we're going to say it's chronic from chinese medicine standards so with that, today we worked on the large intestine. This is about boundaries. You talked about um, certain things. You felt the difference as soon as you rolled your shoulder a few times. And as you moved it, like right now, you can move your shoulder. And you can feel that even loosen up right now. And they're like, oh, yeah, it's even looser now. And it's like, yeah, see? So imagine what this would be like in a few sessions from now. I'm not guaranteeing that this is going to be completely gone, but we'll definitely make some progress. And we'll probably do a similar treatment. How's that sound? Right? So this is kind of like you're getting them to imagine ahead of time of what things are or even on the table where I'll get, again, I'm just going to be peppering them and saying like, hey, um, this seems very chronic. Like, I think we're going to need some more sessions with this. But by the time we get to that sell pitch at the very end, you've already done all, essentially all the work. It's just for them to say yes, which now gets into things like a yes ladder, as they call it. The more they say yes, the more they want to keep going with the yes. So that that's a, definitely a different psychology point, though. But something I've been kind of struggling with around this area is when you phrase things this way, to what extent are you taking away consent? Like if I said, like if I wanted to needle Ren 2 and I need to get them to unbutton their pants to do Ren 2, I could say, are you comfortable with me doing this point? Yes or no. Or I could say, you know, there's this point Ren 2 is right above your pubic symphysis. I'd really like to do this point. I think it'd be really good for you. Are you okay with that? And I feel like making the statement and saying, are you okay with that? I'm more likely to get a yes, but is it I'm circumventing their ability to consent? I mean, Not am I really. making sense? I mean, what, what is that? What I, do you I think understand about that? exactly what you're saying. It's kind of like, okay, so we're doing all these uh, conversational tactics using body language, using a lot of psychology. Is this a good thing or a bad thing for them at this point? All right. So this now comes down to a question of they always have consent. They always have consent. They could say no. However, would you even propose it if it was a bad idea? That that's also the other thing, right? Like you know, we get into these things that people are like, well, um, we don't want to manipulate people. But the thing is, you're manipulating people all day, whether you believe so or not. So this gets into a whole trigger area for people where they say, well, no, I'm not manipulating people. I'm just being honest with them. I'm having a conversation with them. I'm like, well, conversations are communication. Communications means everyone's ideas and statements and worldviews are coming into a certain point. So now it's saying, well, who has a stronger frame of things in particular? Um, Because, you know, you manipulate the coffee to uh, make coffee drink, right? Um, Those beans... Did they have consent? Like this gets into these types of conversations and that's a whole rabbit hole. However, everyone always has the right to say no. And this is why we always establish that all the time in the clinical setting saying like, well, you know, I think this is a good idea, but here's the consequences. If you don't want to do this, that's perfectly fine. Like I'll give it to them and say like, this is the treatment I'm going to do. Um, How's your day? These are consequences if we don't do it. So they can have a full understanding across the board. It's not like I'm withholding the information. Um, even if you're doing dating, you would not withhold the information. It's not like you'd be like, here's a time, here's a date, it's sushi, do you like sushi? Yes or no? If the person's like, well, I'm just going there because you want sushi. Well, no, that's not really the conversation we're having. You're being transparent. And, and I guess this is like an interesting ethical conversation to me where even if we're just getting into things like NLP, it's like there are things you can do that will influence a person's behavior and you get into questions of is that ethical? And I've heard a lot of the NL people, NLP people saying, well, it's all about intentions. If you have good intentions, if you use language in such a way that they're more likely to do, take the course of action that you want, it's all about your intentions. Do you have good intentions for them? And I'm always kind of like, that's a nice story to tell yourself, okay. 
But it's also like you're making a lot of money. You're making money when these people come back. You have you have an, you have a selfish interest that I need oh, to pay my rent. Do. I need to get this person to come back. And so if I use these tactics to influence them to come back, is that still ethical? And then I get into this other side. Well, it's like once the cat's out of the bag, you can't put it back in. Like once I have this knowledge that if I say if I say this sentence this way one thing is more likely to happen. If I say the sentence this other way, they're more likely to come back for a second treatment. It's like, at this point, I have to choose one or the other. And so... Right. And this is where it comes I down to... I don't get to, to claim ignorance anymore. It is very much like that, but I would say it's like, is it the knowledge piece? Like, this gets into, like, this apple and eating conversation. It's like, you were, people have been doing this every single day even before the conversation we had people would act a certain way like if someone's sad what are you doing you might empathize with them if someone's happy you like this is where these are natural behaviors that we're already doing the difference is you know when people are like oh it's a nice narrative and uh you know how are you presenting it's like it's it's good intentions i'd be like then you better check yourself this is some spider-man stuff great responsibility great powers right and this is the thing. Uh, I mean, I could talk easily about hypnosis. If people don't want to be hypnotized, they're not going to be hypnotized. It's very obvious, right? So people are like, oh, they do this trade show stuff and they use hypnosis. Those people want, from a certain level, they value being in front of people. They've already self-selected themselves. So it's the same thing with your clients. The difference is, are you working them toward healing or not? Anything that detracts from their healing and fixing whatever problem they have, I would view as a hindrance. Because they already came in with enough trust and confidence and belief that you can maybe do something. At the point that you are starting to put up your own obstacles because your communication is bad or your uh, area looks horrible or whatever it is. It's basically um, now for the accounting people here and more engineer searches, it's debits and credits. How many pluses can you get? Because they already have a story of you already. It's whether or not you're fitting into their story now. And this now gets into people who are like, what? I'm an independent person. I, I should don't fit in anybody's story. It's like, no, they have a pre-construction of you already. They have a pre-construction of Chinese medicine already. You are just a replacement. For all intents and purposes, it could be anybody for the first time. It does not matter. They don't know who you are. So this is where they've already had the narrative in their head. The question is, are you going to make the narrative stronger or weaker? And that's where it comes down to, you know, are you pre-qualifying all these other things? But the narrative's already there, right? So the manipulation's already there, but they've already done their self-manipulation to get you there for whatever reason. So this is where I think it comes down to, is it working against the narrative that they have formed or is it working with the narrative um, that they have formed? My general take is work with their narrative. Um, and this is where, once you understand that, the manipulation pieces or the influence piece is it's a default behavior now. It's just whether or not you're working with them because ethically your goal as a healer is to heal. Right. I mean, let's be honest. If people want money out of this, this is not the right industry. Not yeah. saying you can't make a good bunk with this, but like literally you have one job yeah. um, in this. So if I'm hindering or if someone's hindering the narrative of healing, then what are you doing? So maybe a good way to round this out is we've talked about a lot of ways to establish rapport, eliciting values, uh, mirroring and leading, social proof, uh, maintaining frame, the using the words and body language and things like that. But I think one of the ways that dating is different from seeing a patient is that if you're dating someone, like your goal is to break down all the boundaries and get as close as possible. With, with a patient, you kind of have this push and pull of you want to establish rapport, you want to establish a connection, but you also need to maintain appropriate boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any advice on that of how do we create this connection but not have it get creepy? <laughs> because I was going to say, like, like question. there's, there's – the, yeah. There's the whole don't date your patients and it's like, yes, you should never ask out your patients. But I've had plenty of cases where the patient tried to ask me out and it ended up in us terminating the right. the, the patient relationship just because they were yeah. too embarrassed to come back in again. So I, I feel right. like this is a thing we need to be aware of. 
Right. Absolutely. And this is where, how chummy do you get with your clients? I think that's one of the things. Like, this is why I say, like, you should have scripts. Uh, you should have your pre-planned things ahead of time. I'm not going to talk to my patients and be like, here's my partner. This is my life problem with my partner. I'm not talking about those details. You know what I'm going to talk about? Mm, you know, I watched a movie. <laughs> right? Like, that's appropriate. But it's not in-depth. And usually the steering of the conversations is, how does this help them in their medical pieces? So it's like my context of a practitioner is I am a storyteller. And in the story, I can relate to you my experiences within the concept of a story of Chinese medicine, but it's still geared to you and how this actually applies to you directly. So even though I might be doing a lecture on TCM stuff with them, it's based in Chinese medicine only. So like, you know, I might know a little bit of their life. They know a little bit about mine. But they know generally the themes are this shoulder has this relationship issue with you. And this, um, you know, if you have chest congestions or whatever it is, this is a narrative of you. I really keep it on them, particularly. Now, this gets into things like um, what's the psychology term? It's not dual relationships. It's uh, like a counter transference and transference, right? But if you keep it on their narrative and let them talk it out, they're probably going to understand that if you keep hitting the medical points and keep referring back to the medical points, they know what this is about. And if people want to take it further on certain things, obviously, um, the, the premise socially is this is a medical treatment. Yes, we may talk about holistic things. Yes, we may talk about some uh, made-up theory, right? Or whatever it is. It does not matter. Because they know the theme is, I'm here for a medical treatment. This does apply to my life. How does it apply to my life? Well, it's because of this, 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 and this. And you line it up every single time in your sessions. Because they come in, they, they come in with a problem. You heal the problem with them. And then you remind them, hey, remember this? This is a medical treatment. And they're like, oh, yeah. So they can feel amazing and they still know the context. So you yeah. just reinforce the context more and more. Okay, so it sounds like we're saying reinforce the medical context, keep it medical, and maybe keep the story focused on them, that they're the Correct. they're the main character in the story. They're okay. the main character, and you could pepper certain things in, like, you know, people ask me, like, hey, Zach, how's your day going? I'm like, it's all right, you know. And then I might say certain things, like, once I started talking about classical theory, people were like, oh, you're this. I'm like, yeah, well, this is kind of what we're about. You don't have to be about it, but this is my lens, and this is what we're doing. This is why I'm getting better results than other people. Um, so understand, you don't need to buy this belief system, which becomes a disqualifier and qualifier at the same time in some ways. I say, this is what I do. You don't have to change anything you do, but the results should speak for themselves. Right? That's usually where, again, I'm very results driven. I'm pretty much like, does it work or doesn't it work? If it doesn't work, I have to look at myself and ask me some harder questions on my diagnosis, my needling point protocols, whatever it is. Um, and then from there, um, that's how you demark things particularly from a uh, client to practitioner relationship. Uh, I think we're getting to the point where you have to get back and treat patients. Uh, any, any other things you want to discuss? Uh, I mean, I could go on and on. So <laughs> it really is just like, this is kind of like, you know, this is one of my yeah. passions around psychology, communication skills. So I could go anywhere with this as a takeaway though. It's one of these things where I'd say, Start reflecting on yourself. I know everyone's like, go reflect on yourself. But I'm like, no, really. Reflect on your language. Literally take a tape recorder and say, what do you say? Are you like, oh, it's like this, and you got the whole valley girl thing going? Yeah. Well, that's not quite professional. Uh, but are like, you going like, for like professional? Re review the game footage. Don't just play right. it in your head. Actually review the game right, footage. Right, because your memory is a horrible <laughs> thing yeah. in particular. Right, like you are going blind spot and uh, take out certain narratives that don't fit you. So understand, like this takes a lot of planning ahead of time from a clinical point. It's saying, who are you? What are your values? What do you want to represent for the healing here? I think that's the first thing. Then script out the things, like literally write out your stories and say, like, all right, what got you into Chinese medicine? Well, I didn't want to do Chinese medicine initially. I was a dating coach. It just seemed better to me at some level because the logic was blah 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 blah. Okay, that's a script. It's true, except now I could spit this out at any point I want, and the emotions with it, the experiences I have, they're all real. However, I could pull that up every single time. So this is one of the things you can do. Write out your scripts and the stories you're going to relate to clients with. Yeah, and I think the having a script thing is important because I would always tell people, like, you need a script of 
how do you explain the needles? When, or when somebody asks, what does acupuncture do? You need a script of a short, concise way to explain this. What is chi? What are you doing in this treatment? You, you need to have those scripts so you can just rattle them off without thinking. And so I think this is a good idea to have those scripts around your stories and your values so you can, you can rattle them off in the same way. So um, I like that. Um, you mentioned you have, you have your own podcast and yep. YouTube so, channel as well. Uh, yeah. The YouTube channel. That's the uh, Wuji Shuen. Um, you just look it up. You'll have those Qigong videos there. Podcast as usual, deeper down the rabbit hole. So you have that, um, for more people into the spirituality slash, um, magic side of things. So we go no holds bar, my master and I, Andrea, we're just like, this is how you do it in real life. And we don't really hold back. So that's where it's like, you know, we generally say results over image. So we do have that if people want to support us for um, the workshops we do. We have workshops online that's hybrid. And uh, I mean, we got a lot of goodies. You just have to look at uh, wujishuen.ca, queencitycurio.ca. Uh, Those are going to be the websites for either you're interested in the spirituality side of things or you're in the wellness side of things. Yeah, and we're working on a four needle technique class. Uh, maybe we can just say that that's in the works right now. It will be coming up eventually. Um, that that was that was one of the more popular podcast episodes where I think I did a video that was just explaining here's how you do it in terms of if you have to answer a question on boards. Here's maybe how you get to the correct answer. But then later we did a podcast where we went to more into the actual clinical applications of that. So that's something we'll be expanding into a course. So you can keep an eye out for that. Um, go back and watch some of the older YouTube videos and podcast episodes about that. But we'll. We're working on a course for that, so you can look forward to that in the next couple months. Yep, definitely going to be a fun full day course on that one, so keep your eyes out. Awesome. Zach, thanks for being here. Thanks for spending your lunch hour with me. Thank you, Nicholas. Always a pleasure. <laughs>